It is a great pleasure to have Sophie and Yin together in this conversation. And some time ago, I realized when I would listen to Yin talking about decolonizing the system structures or to Sophie about healthy human cultures, that for some reason I wanted to have both of them in the same conversation. And here it is. And my intention in bringing this together and to offering it to Nawat and to whoever wants to listen to it is that I feel that we need to bring awareness to parts of us as individuals and as part of organizations and groups, activism, um, even our single um, en endeavors to change the system in any way, bringing awareness to those parts of ourselves that are a result of those traumatized or colonized structures that most of us have grown up within. And for me it's important to have that awareness because I believe that if we don't, then we are bringing part of those systems that we are trying to transform into our new strategies. So we are rather perpetuating the system instead of transforming it. So that's my intention. And I'm get very grateful to everyone who's here holding this space with me. And to start, I would love to hear Sophie and Yin just introducing themselves in a way that just naming what you think is important for people to know about the way that brought you here to this day. Thank you. And welcome everybody. Uh, um, what to say, I, um, I feel like I've had these very different threads in my life. So, you know, I came, I came from a family that didn't really speak about feelings, that was very, um, intellectual and uh, thought it would be good to have lots of science background so that I could understand the technologies of the world as that was where I was heading. So I started out life as an engineer, a uh, very mathematical modeling of systems. How do we turn the physical world into math, math so that we can figure out how it works? Um, I got radicalized by being a woman in a very male dominated um, engineering world came out as a lesbian soon after leaving university, played radical lesbian football for quite a long time in East London, um, learned a lot about systems of oppression and marginalization in a very mixed football team where we challenged all oppression and really looked at how the dynamics of race and class and gender and sexuality uh, were present in our team and what it meant to try to play football in a different way. Uh, and then I uh, ended up as a psychotherapist, uh, realizing that technology really didn't have the answers I was looking for. So going on a much more inward journey, um, starting to find answers when I started to learn about the unconscious. Um, so, you know, seeing this crazy world heading for destruction, you know, even as, an, as a young person, seeing how unsustainable the world was in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and, and once I started to understand more about the landscape of my own dysfunction, the dysfunction of my family, the systems, that was really helpful. And then, yeah, found myself as part of the transition movement, um, which started here in Devon, moved out of London, came to Devon. So, yeah, so then in transition, everything that I'd done started to be used in this kind of much more holistic systems change inquiry. How do we shift communities um, so you know learned a lot more and and when I looked back I started to fit these disparate pieces together that actually systems the system of a football team you know the system of a culture engineering systems the systems of change towards um, a more positive future actually that's the kind of unifying thread of my life so yeah that's a bit about my journey thank you Thank you, Sophie. Well, um, 
a bit about me, I guess. I'm going to riff off some of what Sophie's talked about and say that um, I started my uh, academic career studying theoretical physics uh, in undergraduate and uh, changed major to mathematics and computer science and then went on to do um, biostatistics. Uh, so yeah, also a little bit on the uh, scientific side of uh, academia. Uh, as a Aboriginal man, uh, Wakaya, a my mob uh, from Northern Australia, I kind of slowly came to understand the deep problems of colonial societies through that um, experience of being Aboriginal. I started working in uh, Indigenous health, trying to understand the many disparities between uh, Aboriginal people in Australia and other Australians. And that brought me into working in public health. And then I decided to do one of the first studies in Australia looking at the health impacts of racism for Aboriginal people. And I guess I've been on this slow and not very linear kind of um, uh, more um, spontaneous uh, waves of learning uh, about coloniality and capitalism and modernity, which I'll speak a little bit about soon. So I've always been academic, really. Um, that's basically, I've had a few other odd jobs, but that's basically my um, work path, but have changed um, very much from physics to being uh, very interested in race relations and decoloniality and indigenous knowledges now. So it's quite a, quite a large jump there. And uh, I've been starting to run some courses online about decolonization and indigenous perspectives. And that's where I met Dita and uh, she's invited me to a couple of forums since then. Thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of um, different approaches in both of you um, to how to, to even the theory and, and the, the physicality as well of, of systems. Um, I wonder if there is a, a pattern there. Um, yeah, so uh, Sophie, would you like to take us through your views of systems? You are muted. You are on mute. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, first system change. Find your voice. Uh, yeah, I'm really appreciating you know, hearing your path in and, and then sort of reflecting that for me, that, you know, in a way, that, that sort of sense of, of starting out in, in a in a worldview and then finding how much it didn't fit and how much it didn't answer the questions and how much it didn't really explain or go deep enough to explain what I saw was happening in the world and also didn't help me to find an answer to what had happened to me. So you know, um, growing up in this family that was very intellectual, but actually had very little capacity for speaking about the emotional layers of what was happening between us. Um, very little support for the, the journeys that we were on as we grew up as children, um, you know, from very well-meaning parents. Uh, and so, so I had that as a kind of foundational experience. And then I feel like my life has been a kind of steady, um, loosening of worldviews that I grew up in and an expanding to see and to welcome and to be able to make meaning out of pain in the system. So for me, um, <clears throat> one of the uh, sort of central characteristics of human systems, so, so for me there's something, there's systems 
and, and people are often looking at living systems and what happens in nature. But there's something for me that's a particular inquiry about human systems with this question, you know, what is it in us that makes us capable of creating so much suffering? And, and is that really anybody's intention? You know, is that really an intention that anybody has to deliberately create this amount of harm to each other, harm to self, harm to the living world on which we, de we depend? Um, and, and that question, why do we do that? Uh, how, do, how is it that we keep going with that? And, and what is it about our systems that enable that to be so difficult to change? You know, how is it that we manage to do that for me is a really fundamental kind of systems question of our time. Um, and and I, I guess, like I said, for me, that the place where I started to find answers was when I started to learn, you know, from from Western tradition. So my um, psychotherapy training was in psychosynthesis, which is a kind of Western evolution um, of, you know, the the very young traditions of psychoanalysis or psychological inquiry in the West. Um, but with a spiritual perspective. So Asa Jolie, who brought, who, who brought that, you know, was interested not just in the pathology and the pain, but also in the potential. Um, so I feel like I've had this framing of what is health and where is their pain and dysfunction, and, uh, and then a distinction between the pain that is healthy pain, you know, because pain is part of life, you know, transitions, um, death, aging, loss, change, all of these things naturally bring pain. Um, and I think it's really interesting to make a distinction between that kind of pain that life always brings and the kind of pain that's created because we have dysfunctional systems and actually, you know, embodied uh, culturally normalized systems of harm. So coloniality being one of them, you know, patriarchy, uh, marginalization of the natural world, these systems of centering some things and using other things. Um, you know, one, one way to look at those systems is, it, it's, you know, it's not necessarily about the desire to be in a position of domination, but about a way of managing trauma and managing my own pain. When I exist in a culture where, the, where we've lost the traditions and the practice of being able to hold and process and metabolize pain together. So um, some, some of you have seen some of my maps and models, you know, for me, part of the characteristic of healthy human systems is that, you know, when life brings us the natural evolved wise states of response to threat, danger, um, violence, which are the kind of uh, try to negotiate, you know, get into flight, fight, freeze, these naturally evolved nervous system states that set up um, particular conditions in our body. Uh, in healthy cultures and cultures that can maintain health, we have a return path. So whether that's to do with micro damage, you know, microaggression, micro harm, we know how to repair relationships through apology, through communication, through being held in the circle, um, through being able to speak about what's caused us pain, bring our vulnerability. Um, I, I think a lot of our wiring about expressing pain is actually evolved as processes that support us to repair. So, you know, people that I've heard, for instance, Dominic Barr to say, you know, feelings are the best guide to the landscape of conflict. Um, so for me, we wired, wired up and, and evolved to, to have these ways of expressing hurt as we became more complex and more attuned to relationship and to um, healthy relationship. And then there's something about what happens when a culture is so collectively traumatized that those processes are lost. So um, whether, you know, once the culture is has lost those and, and is on a path where it's increasingly run by traumatized states, you know, I, I guess what I see historically is that they then go and um, take resources from someone else, but also start to export their pain into the bodies of other people. And that will happen within the culture. So there'll be people with more 
um, capacity, more power, more identification with strength, who will put it into the bodies of the poor, of the women, of the weak ones, of the marginalized, of the homeless, of the outsiders or the disabled, you know, but also will, you know, a society like that can colonize another society and start putting the trauma into the bodies of other people. Um, you know, it, I feel it was done to this country, you know, if I identify as English, that the Romans did it to us, um, you know, centuries and centuries ago. Um, we, we went on doing it to ourselves in Europe. The amount of bodied trauma between white people in Europe is phenomenal during the centuries after the Romans. And then we went and did it to a lot of black and brown bodies in other parts of the world. Um, and, and what I see is that, is that you know, when, when there's a collective process of traumatization like colonization or war, um, or a kind of mass disaster where the structures, the elders, the language, the traditions, the social technologies that help to keep hearing pain, metabolizing pain, you know, releasing pain, um, using pain as something that weaves us back together as a community. When that is lost, then the system basically becomes run by traumatized states. And I think it's interesting to look at um, Western modern colonial patriarchal culture through the nervous system states, you know, the sort of residual nervous system states of fight, flight, freeze, um, negotiate. So, you know, seeing the kind of manic mania of economic, endless economic growth as a kind of flight you know, as oh, an economic competition as a kind of fight response. The world is dangerous, there's scarcity. I have to get what I want. I must never stop, I'm gonna distract myself. You know, now we've got all these technologies that mean we never pause and we're very, very defended culturally against feeling pain, you know, collectively in the, in the modern, especially urban, you know, culture. And, 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 and that's a very sensible response. You know, these traumatized responses are sensible if you don't have a space where you can metabolize pain, you know, uh, until you can, until there's enough safety, until there's enough holding, keeping our pain out of our awareness is a wise choice. We evolved that capacity to do that um, because if we let it back in and there's not a place to metabolize it, firstly, I can be overwhelmed. We can be overwhelmed by that experience of it surfacing again. And then we also in a culture that tends to persecute or marginalize or pathologize the healthy expression of pain, you know, I may get attacked, isn't it? I may get shut down, um, pathologized, locked up, um, medicated, you know, sectioned. Um, if I really let the, the pain that I'm um, holding and carrying in my body express without there being a specifically designed container for it. Um, so, you know, one of the places that that's taken me to is holding grief tending ceremonies. Um, you know, to, so how do we do this not as a privatized one to one? How do we make metabolizing and making meaning of grief something that is held by the collective? Um, and, and I see that that's just one part of a return path, you know, one part of putting back into human systems the technologies that we've lost and that I believe, you know, traditional cultures that lived in peaceful and um, more healthy ways. I don't, I, I don't know that there's such a thing as perfect health. You know, I see that they all had some technology for metabolizing, you know, the embodied residual stress of potentially traumatizing situations, whether it's sweat lodges or, you know, dances or rituals or grief ceremonies or something. Uh, yeah, so that's quite a lot. That, that, that's kind of where my thinking is at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I would invite people to just have a moment before moving on, give us the luxury of time and space. And I want to acknowledge as well that sometimes just listening to 
what Sophie was talking about can be quite triggering um, and bring some pain. So I invite you to be very gentle, maybe hold yourself with your heart covered by your hand. And again, feel the support of the earth. And I believe in the wisdom of our bodies. I think some of those things that have been erased, erased from my culture, they still live in me somehow. And perhaps the trick is to reconnect with that wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Dita. I'm going to share a few uh, slides just because I, I'm quite word focused, uh, written word focused. So it helps me to plan what I'm going to say. And maybe some people will appreciate some visuals as well. So I'll start with uh, deep history of what I call modernity, which is basically what we have now. So this is the story as far as I can see it. Um, what we have now in modernity is something of an aberration uh, in history. For most of history, we lived in very different ways to how we live now. Ways that are social and kind and caring and compassionate. As Sophie said, there's no such thing as perfect health. In fact, I think the whole idea of perfection is um, dangerous, but healthier ways than we do now uh, in almost all the world. So egalitarian, participatory, dynamic equilibrium, and kinship um, with all life. And then something went wrong about 10,000 years ago. It wasn't exactly agriculture that was to blame, but permanent settled agriculture, which um, was the new thing that happened. In Australia, we've had agriculture for 30, 40,000 years, but it's not quite the same as settling in one place and just farming. So that happened somewhere in the fertile present about 10,000 years ago. And it, it something followed from that where people became lost in their ways. They stopped following the natural laws, L-O-R-E, and of the land. And that settledness, that being in one place, left people vulnerable, susceptible to exploitation, domination, and oppression. And around about that time, within a few thousand years of that time and coming up to AD, eventually uh, arose these sorts of things, debt, money, armies, slavery, rulers, institutions, patriarchy, monogamy, proto-states. Those are new things. They've only been around for a few percent of our species as a history. And I think it's fair to say they haven't gone very well. So zooming in much more closely to our time, we see the more classic history of modernity from the 15th century on. Creation of private property through violent enclosure of land throughout Europe, colonial usurping of all sorts of indigenous territory around the world, remnants of proto-feminism crushed by the witch hunts uh, of the Middle Ages and onwards. Production, distribution, exchange controlled by a wealthy elite. So rulers have been around for a long time. We saw from ancient Egypt, really, the, the rise of the kind of um, the rationalization for rule, uh, rulers as gods and so forth. But the intensification of this, the industrialization of this, the invention of wage labor is much newer uh, than that. 
And then we see maps like this, European control of the world, colonization by a very specific form of, of life, of human life, which has taken over almost every part of the world now, a rather unhealthy way of life. And this is the result, which everyone I'm sure is aware of. Um, continued extermination of Indigenous people, mass poverty, poverty around the world, eight men who are wealthier than half the world's population, 1.6 billion people without adequate housing, a quarter of children are nourished across the globe. These are the, the impacts of that very much uh, dominating system. And uh, I mean, the best way to describe it is like a cancer, really, a cancer on human societies. Uh, it arose in a certain place and it spread quite rapidly from there. So more small bad news that we know about, you know, the mass extinction, climate change. This is all a direct result of the kind of society that we have and, and the kind of um, direction we're going, of course, is towards the collapse of this civilization that has been developing over some thousands of years and particularly in the last 500. This is a great diagram uh, from the early 20th century that I think sums it up quite well. In particularly these days, we have capitalist colonial societies, capitalism on top. Uh, we rule you, we fool you. That's an organized institutionalized religion. We shoot at you, the military industrial carceral complex. We eat for you, the elite, the rich, the 1%, and the people who work for all of that and feed everyone in that system. The, uh, working class or now the proletariat or the unnecessary uh, the the people who are easily disposable by colonial capitalist patriarchal systems so this was produced in 1920 something i believe as a part of the ongoing efforts of course to change to raise awareness and change the system that we live in then we have nation states, uh, which started really way back um, in the early uh, uh, period after uh, five, six thousand years ago, for at least. Uh, Proto nations, we still have them, they're everywhere now. But almost every part of the world is claimed by a nation state, not, not every last inch, but most of it. So nations are very much about debt, property, institutions, labor coercion, tax collection. A lot of violence, our, our whole societies are really built on violence of various forms. Some are more obvious, some are less obvious. My view is that we don't need any of these things, uh, debt, property, institutions, or nations, and that they are actively uh, harming people uh, as a general rule. They're not needed to protect us from ourselves because we're quite uh, capable of caring generous connected relations um, without being told what to do by rulers it's a bit of a busy slide i won't go through it all but there's there's critiques there's decolonial critiques really of all the modern promises that we have economic growth through exploitation security through violence singular knowledge systems through suppression of other ways of understanding the world hierarchies of status that means some people are unworthy others are more worthy uh, consumption through just rampant destruction of the world and this idea of separability individualism independence that refuses the deep profound interdependence that we um, need to exist to to stay alive and to, to flourish and thrive recently someone said to me uh, that the world today uh, is the best it's ever been Took me a few days to to, to process the uh, the shock of that uh, that statement. I think it's fair to say that I profoundly disagree with that statement. Uh, things have definitely been better through a lot of human history. This is a bit of a graphic from some of my favourite decolonial theorists, just trying to sort of get uh, into that idea that. Everything is awesome. 
uh, people in Africa have mobile phones and washing machines. We have science, democracy, and so forth. But underneath that, and other parts of this diagram, we see a bit more of a chilling story of increasing worsening of inequality and rampant violence and destruction of the planet and all that stuff I've mentioned already. And even really uh, people who are traditionally privileged in first world countries, so-called, are starting to suffer um, much more. We've passed peak anything really and it's all downhill from here with the system that we have so this is uh just a little bit of a busy slide of all the things that we have too much of uh in the systems and societies that exist now too many words to read out but i think you can absorb a sense of where i'm getting at there uh, in terms of the things I, I think we could do with a lot less of and here's a slide of the things I think we could do with a lot more of in our society, in our cultures that uh, constitute modernity. And that's enough from me, I'd say. Thank you. Thank you, Yin. Yeah. Like before, I would personally really appreciate to have just a, some moments of silence to let that sink in. And perhaps reminding myself and everyone that we have those, there's plenty of those things that we could have less of, possibly or most likely in ourselves as well. And that there are these, there's plenty as well of the things that we could have more of. So inviting that resource in, in us. And I, had, I remember um, from a conversation I had with you, Yin, when you mentioned the idea of looking for epiphany in my life that has been very present with me. So I invite that right now to get resourced by finding epiphany in just the beauty of being alive. Thank you. So following a bit like a, this beautiful movement of a circle, I would like to see if Sophie, you want to take it from there in some way. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um. I feel uh, I'm I'm feeling the impact of those last slides. I mean, all uh, everything that you share, Yin, isn't it? It, it? it doesn't feel like new information, but seeing it put together has a has a big impact. Um, but there's something especially about that that sense of of, of how is it possible um, that there are people who think this is the best time on the planet? You know that humanities do. How is that possible? whilst the extent of suffering and um, uh, yeah the extent of, of suffering and I, I don't know like the feeling is of kind of bodies crushed you know it, it with 
the the weight of challenge of just surviving or or creating a good life for your children or just um being able to 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 come out from the kind of embodied stress when there's scarcity or toxicity or um brutality or violence or constant injustice and that um and one of the things that, that I'm with is how how much separation there is in our system, you know, so, you know, looking at your last slide, what is it we need more of, you know, the word grief at the top for me feels like one of these, you know, the engineer in me that wants the feedback loop so that the system can understand itself and know itself, you know, and this sense that um, grief is such an important feedback signal. Um, you know, one of the, like, like a, a kind of driving um, motivator for my inquiry in, in around the sort of systems um, models that I ended up with was, was looking at burnout uh, in the transition movement. And, you know, Dita, you brought that question at the beginning, like how are these patterns of dysfunction part of um, and and you know within transition as as within many environmental movements there was a high degree of burnout and yet you could say one of our um, motivating purposes was to prevent the burnout of the planet um, and I think it's you know I think it's really interesting when you get these sort of um, juxtapositions of Oh, so so we're all about peace, and yet our organisation actually has a lot of conflict. Or you know, we're really about inclusion, and yet we're very white and middle class. Or you know, we're all about something, and actually, when I step back and look, you know, we're not managing to embody that principle um, in what happens in our movement. Um, yeah, I feel like I've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole, but there's something for me about the system knowing and understanding itself. So, so burnout for me is a symptom of something. And if your mission is about burnout, actually it felt important to have a really deep inquiry about burnout. What is it about burnout that we haven't understood enough of um, that, we're, that we're creating it in our movement while we say we're about healing it in the world. <clears throat> and it took me to this understanding about nervous systems and archetypes. So, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting to ask, um, I, I found these archetypes of, you know, what I now refuse to gender, but an archetype around strength or yang or fire, um, or, you know, Martin Luther King talked about strength and love, that if you're building a movement for change, we need these archetypes to be both present. It's not enough to just have strength and not love, but it's also not enough to have love and not strength. So we need to be weaving these archetypes together. And, and I found these pairs of, you know, not identical, but kind of comparable archetypes in lots of different cult cultures. So in my training, it was love and will. Like a healthy human being is somebody that has a healthy capacity for love and a healthy capacity for will. And I got curious whether these relate, you know, the engineer wants to find the physiological underpinnings. Is this to do with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? So one, one part of the unconscious autonomous nervous system that organizes us that's about mobilizing it's about doing stuff it's about getting our heart rate up and you know um, taking action in the world and another part of our autonomous unconscious nervous system that is uh, about rest about soothing about connection about digestion about about um yeah all of those softer about receptivity about listening um, and that when these are in health and, and and there's a balance and there's a flow then we create healthy culture or then there's a possibility of healthy culture and and then there are these situations of overwhelm you know and I think this question about when did it happen or what was the cause and you know seeing agriculture as a potential cause um, and, and where I've got to is 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 
I, I think that any group of human beings has the capacity for its culture to deteriorate from, you know, what I totally agree is our natural state. I think we evolved to be in kindness, in generosity, in mutual care, in reciprocity. But we always have the capacity to go into increasing degrees of conflict and difficulty and um, splitting between unhealthy forms of the archetype into a distorted strength that, that is bullying or domination or exerting my needs at the expense of others and a distorted love that has lost connection to its strength, you know, that becomes passive, stuck in, um, in inaction. Uh, if we don't have the capacity to, me to metabolize the emergency states of those nervous systems. Um, so, you know, there is, if there's a residual fight flight in my body, I'm going to be triggered into the kind of hyper aroused fight flight state very easily because there's something that's out of awareness, but that's actually um, in charge of my behavior. And the same, you know, if I have a lot of freeze in me, um, then I'll dissociate, I'll shut down, I'll numb out, um, because that's my both wired in and often learned response. Um, and I just want to say, you know, for me, this isn't about uh, denying the forces of brutality that have inflicted these states on populations, you know, but um, so there's something for me but about acknowledging that I also have that capacity, you know, that, it, that I think it's our evolutionary challenge as we've become, you know, gone through the stages of, of evolution and increasing complexity. And, you know, now we're, we're on this sort of reinforcing loop where our technology is being designed by a dysfunctional part of our psyche. So, so we're designing technologies that are about unsafety. So, you know, our brilliant minds are designing weapons rather than peacemaking technology. Um, our creative minds are, are going into the, it's, it's like I can feel my grief, are going into selling us shit that we don't need instead of celebrating the beauty of life. It's, it's like now our system is being organized by the, the, these dysfunctional parts to create more and more and more dysfunction. So we have, you know, what in it you'd call the positive feedback loop where the dysfunction is getting bigger and, and the part of the feedback that would help us to reduce these, these patterns, which for me is the pain, is paying attention to the conflict, it's paying attention to where there is suffering, that bit of feedback is being pushed out. You know, we don't wanna to listen to that. We're not going to sit in our board meetings and say, has anybody felt upset by the fact that our corporation has been toxifying landscapes or giving cancer to children? Is that impacting anybody? You know, shall we, shall we listen to that as a signal? What's happening in our bodies when we acknowledge that? So there's this huge separation and a culture in boardrooms and in political circles in the, in the West, which I don't believe is true of indigenous cultures, you know, of, of cultures that had these traditions where vulnerability and pain is prohibited and and I want to say I have found that to be the case in a lot of movements for positive change that there's still a culture of prohibiting or marginalizing um, trauma and pain you know and I think that that's one of the places where I feel like, you know, can, can we change something? You know, is there a, is there a possibility that we, that we shift that system in, in the places that we um, have some agency as well as talking about that? And I see people talking about trauma and collective trauma. I feel like the West, as I've understood it, you know, the understandings around embodied trauma and collective trauma are shifting massively in the last, you know, year, five years, 20 years. It's completely different to when I trained as a therapist 20 years ago. So anyway, enough, thank you. And thank you so much, Ian, for how you've put all of those, uh, all of that information together in a way that is so impactful.
Thank you, Sophie. I'm learning a lot from listening to you speak. Resonates with me a lot. Well, I do want to open to discussion soon, but I'm just going to fire up the slideshow again for, I think, four, four more slides that are about specifically about decolonization and where I think we could go with that. So here's a philosophy in four dot points of what I consider decolonial perspectives to be about one way of framing them anyway. Nothing is complete, perfect or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational and deeply sacred. We are immersed in unsensed worlds, other ways of being, otherwise and elseness, which we can strive to sense, inhabit, commingle and grow with. There's so much more to everything than any of us realize. We are invited to outgrow the often unquestioned need to obey, conform, judge and repress which stunts our ability to express, create, connect, and play. We are called to conscious, embodied, loving, reverent co-liberation with each other and the living cosmos, the cosmos that is alive and sentient in all, all its aspects. And so this future that we are called to as our civilization collapses is about relinquishing debt and property and institutions and nation states which just breed radical alienation from ourselves. We don't even know ourselves the way we could. Other living beings, our work and so-called nature. We need to unlearn things like reductionism, truth, rightness, power over, ambition, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtue, validation, heroism, fame, merit, entitlement, duty, and sacrifice. And instead, explore ways of becoming, relating, and perceiving that create a life beyond exceptionalism, human exceptionalism, exploitation, extraction, consumption, growth, and the hubris and arrogance and narcissism of our species that has been growing over the last few thousand years. So it's an invitation, I think, to strive for societies that value self-realization, freedom, interdependence, care, love, connection, celebration, beauty, grief, and cooperation without institutionalized, fossilized, exploitative hierarchies that hoard resources produced by the labor of others. We should weave, I think, with an invitation to weave networks of embodied local cooperative communities grounded in things like anarchy, degrowth, wilding, unschooling, permaculture, decolonization, myth, ritual, and ceremony that can cultivate lives which are so much more authentic, creative, thriving, playful, vivid, visceral, plural, messy, vulnerable, sacred, sensuous, joyful, sensible lives. And the challenge in doing that is to inhabit and discomfort to dwell in the unknowable unexpected uncertain unthinkable and the imperceptible or at least that which we haven't yet perceived we're going to make a lot of mistakes hopefully new ones that are unique uh, that take us beyond convenience and choice and conviction this is beyond conviction and principles it's something deeper that we need to get in touch with in ourselves and in our living cosmos that we are part of we need to metabolize our assumptions, complicities, tensions, paradoxes, predictions, fragilities, and traumas to move into a new way of becoming. Discern, perceive, relate, and become without narrative, meaning, identity, intellectualization, judgment, comparison, justification, or condemnation, all of which our lives are basically um, built on at this point in time.
Thank you. Okay, so I just want to say, may it be so. Mm. Mm. And I think that maybe it's just what I need right now. I, I would like to invite us again to find our bodies and remember that our hands actually can do quite a lot in supporting us. So I invite us to Place your hands wherever your body feels that it needs an extra bit of care. And I feel my heart pounding. Um, and I think, yeah, well, before, before we open, the discussion to everyone I, there's something that is really burning to in me and when you were um, bringing that vision of a decolonized future I, there's so much that resonates um i'm sorry i feel quite emotional about it um and there is that rush, rush of it wanting to come out. And then I guess my question um, my question is how do I trust? How do I trust? Or maybe I don't have to. Maybe I don't, maybe I, I have to let go of the need of trusting that it will just come out and unfurl by itself because I'm feeling I'm, 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 despite years of work and and, and uh, work on myself I mean um, I am I'm still recognizing places in me that are very much part of those systems that are keeping that challenge of the future um, kind of a challenge uh, instead of a reality of the present so is it does any of you have, and I, I, I'm, I'm really wary of recipes, so I'm, I'm not asking for a recipe, although I would love to, but it's how I, I'm just throwing that out there. I feel that we come, maybe more people like me in the society that I live, we are quite entrapped. And this is not justification for anything I do. It's, a, it's an honest question about how do I, as an individual, as part of an organization, how do I bring, that challenge in an honest and, and with the possibility of actually going through it to, to my everyday without bringing my trauma, without bringing those uh, structures that can hide so, so well in the, in, the, in the strategies. Well, personally, I think you should bring your trauma. I think you should lean into it. Mm. I think you should share it with everybody. I think you should call it in to the circles and shout it out to the world. We need to metabolize a hell of a lot of trauma and suffering. And the first step is to to share, to talk, to discuss, to, it's just like, I need to share with you that recently one of my colleagues uh, committed suicide. But the family didn't want to talk about that. They didn't want to say that's what happened. They didn't want to say that the person took their own life. They wanted to plaster over that and deny that and 
submerge that truth. And this is the problem that we have. Mm. We, as Sophie has so eloquently said, we, we run, we run from, we fly, flee from, from pain. And in fleeing from pain, it becomes suffering. Suffering, the etymology of the word suffering means to carry. And pain, when you carry it, becomes suffering. In indigenous cultures, pain flows through people. It's metabolized very quickly through ritual and ceremony and deep relating. But in our societies, it just stays and it builds up like silt in our massive dams that we created that, that will soon destroy the dams, like silt in a dam, our pain and suffering. Our pain becomes suffering and builds up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm also really looking forward to hearing hearing from others. Um, you know, but for me, that, that that it is about an inquiry, isn't it? It's, it's, so there's something for me about as we show up, knowing that we have the system wired into our bodies, knowing that by, my beliefs are shaped, you know, both by the health in the system, um, and 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 all of the millennia of evolution in socially functional, well attached you know, untraumatized, hopefully, you know, um, history that, that I've got both in me. I've got both. In, so, the, so the question is always, and, and, and what's this part of me that's showing up? And, and it's not just about me, is it's like, and in this field of relating that we're creating in this meeting and this project and this collaboration, what, where is their health and where is their dysfunction? And to be curious about the conflict and lean into it and to be curious about your emotions. So I'm so welcoming, Dita, as I'm trying to welcome my whilst a, a judgmental bit of me is also saying don't start crying when you're a presenter <laughs> you know like how can we keep on um and there's something about you know we talk about it in the grief tending so Dita and I do a lot of grief tending work together that in that ceremony we build the banks of the river so there's something for me about like you say in creating a space so I see your question Helena for me we don't we don't necessarily want the grief to flow all the time through all of our action projects but there's a there's something about this flow where sometimes we're really going to make a space for that and we're really going to listen sometimes we're going to really pay attention to the conflict and the dynamics and we're going to honor and tend it and be curious about it and bring skills in and do that and sometimes maybe we're just going to put that aside because we do need to get on with this project or we need to get this thing done because that's going to support us and our purpose the most and sometimes we may have meetings where there's space for both you know, and for me, that's this thing of cultural design. How do we design meetings? How do we design processes, routines? You know, seeing that healthy cultures will have had rhythms, you know, a daily rhythm, but they'll also have had other bigger cycles of we tend our grief once a week or we honor the seasons. And in the season of the leaves falling, that's when we, you know, honor the dead and remember decay and we let our grief flow in this particular sense. And, you know, we celebrate birth and you, isn't it? we would have had all of these rhythms and processes built built in and I feel you know we sit we sit with it in the grief tending how as a white middle class English person do I not culturally appropriate from traditions that my culture's destroyed how do I try to resurrect what's wired into my body how do I try to co-create with others some of these rituals and practices that have enough strength that have enough power that call in the sacred when I didn't grow up with any tradition around that how do I do that you know and I feel like I'm constantly trying to remake a culture from this sort of desert <laughs> you know this void inside me um, and I'm and I'm grateful for all the pieces and the fragments and those that are still holding and resurrecting you know living and, and not yet dead traditions um, while sitting with the guilt of my privilege and the cost of that, you know, in, in global terms and being willing to sit with it, isn't it? Like for me, part of 
the thing we need to be able to learn is uh, for me as, as, as very privileged in this system to sit with the discomfort of guilt, to sit with the shame and still not dissociate or still not walk away from the conversation. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that's what I want from the places where as a woman, I feel on the downside of the oppression. You know, I want men that will sit in the discomfort of the conversation about the brutality that women have experienced and not run away, you know, and I want to be able to do that as white or English or something else. Can I stay? Anyway, I, I'd really love to hear from some other people and thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dita, for inviting this space and, you know, all of those listening. So yeah, it'd be lovely to hear, but Dita, back to you to- Thank you, yes, I, I would love that too. So please, everybody who wants to be on video, come back. And if you prefer to stay off, I really invite self-care and be, be allowing and know that everything is welcome. I welcome every, every part of you right now. This is about being fully human. So lovely to see you all. So I think we have time for maybe two or three questions, depending on how or comments, every, any, anything you want to share. And I'm really happy to stay afterwards and you can send questions via the chat or to me and I'm sure we can continue this discussion in some way. So the floor is open, just jump in. And it might be a song, mightn't it? It might be a sound, it might be a, a, a gesture, isn't it? It's like, it'd be just lovely to give expression to whatever's moving in you right now. Um, however, that wants to come and to trust that it'll serve the circle and serve this inquiry in some way. Uh, I don't have a song <laughs> just now. <laughs> um, I'm just checking that you can hear me because I'm outside. I'm own oh, this is I can hear you lying down on the grass listening this is the first time I've had an outdoors meeting it's very exciting and I guess what's been what I've been in touch with or kind of forming in response to what I've been hearing is this kind of this part of me that wants to <laughs> what's an answer? Wants to know the way. Wants to know how to get out of this trap. And what I'm being reminded of by both of you is that yeah, there isn't <laughs> there isn't an answer. There isn't one answer. But what I'm what I'm sensing is a kind of moving between. Uh, 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 you know, it it being enough that sometimes we look at the trauma. It being enough that sometimes we feel safe. It being enough that sometimes we're in action and, um, you know, sometimes we're in challenge and sometimes we're in safety. And that um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the work that we're doing to try to make change, um, it, it, there are different things are needed at different times. So at the moment, my focus is, well, <laughs> probably way too split. But I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of kind of inquiry going on about because I'm, I'm looking at how we make our collective decisions differently and with more of everything that you've been bringing in them. Um, and I'm just at the very beginning of starting a process in my own community around that. Um, and just so uh, painfully aware of how deeply countercultural most of what you're bringing is to most people. It's, I think a lot of people know these things in their bodies, but really, really, really quite far away from them in their minds and in terms of what they might expect of a public meeting or a, um, you know, any kind of community process. So I'm looking at like, so what is, 
what are our what are our learning journeys how do we start this in a really light way or in a way that's really recognizable to people um, and then create other opportunities so um, I love the board meeting idea um, and imagine you know, a community meeting where we're here to talk about community matters and, you know, all the different things that people might be interested in. Um, but then we also talk about what people are feeling sad about. Um, and then maybe there's an additional process that some people can go to and some people don't have to, where we can really dig into that, that sadness. So, you know, just thinking about the way the kind of almost like the, the be like water you know the way that we can move between things and between different states and that our solutions don't have to just be one way um they can be they can be really various and that's that's what's been sort of kindled in me listening to you guys thank you so much mm. Thank you, Eva. I, I wanted to first just acknowledge, you know, Sophie and Dita for bringing this. It just feels, you know, when I feel like I'm a, immersed in all this inquiry and then you've just dropped me so much down to an, a very intense level. And yeah, as you say, what, what, what's, the, what's the roadmap from here? And I know we have to make it up as we go along, which is which is beautiful, but scary and and wonderful. All, all it's everything mixed in at once. Um, something that came up for me that there was a message in the chat about sort of the masculine feminine issue, and part of that goes to the heart of my inquiry. I, I'm taking everything back to the sort of the Bible that we've built our whole story on the trauma of Adam and Eve and what went on, and you know. That whole that whole rift and the whole and that we don't get told the full story, and uh, the Lilith story and the Eve story and the consent and the descent and 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 I and I I fear that our whole issue between gender and sex that's going on at the moment is just part of that journey of trying to understand the, the rift that we have and that that is at the heart of what we're doing to the world that the. the the rift in ourselves between our inner masculine and feminine is enabling us to to create this rift on on mother earth and ourselves and it's it's and i'm i'm just interested in the in the gender thing and and why people are so scared of naming masculine and feminine and being masculine and feminine as, as we are all both and I'm, I'm just it's, i'm just sort of putting that out there as part of the story really I'd love to speak to that, but I'm I'm also wanting to just keep hearing hearing back from people. So <laughs> I'm noticing that one and a half hours is never enough. Um, I've had the good fortune to develop a very close friendship with um, local aunties here in, in my area in Australia, New South Wales. And I feel the most incredible pain that is not possible to put into words at the trauma that they are surviving, just about. And I struggle with how I can show up for them in my best possible self in a way that's not going to increase the trauma I love them dearly, um, but I come from the system 
so I bring it with me. Um, and sometimes I feel a rage. Um, Uh, that is so huge that there can be that degree of suffering and that it's not recognised, that Australia's this, you know, first world country and people talk about the global south and they forget that locked inside Australia is this other, which is not third world, it's worse. And um, yeah, I hold sharing circles and um, deep listening and um, work with Dadiri and um, Theory U. My European community members ridicule the sharing circles and don't wish to join them. I struggle with that. I so struggle with that. It's, I, I can't, yeah. How do we create a space where all people can be equal and loved and held and how can we create a space that allows for the ancestors and the trees and the spirits to all be part of the circle so together we can sit together and find a solution I'm not asking for an answer. So thank you for letting me just share that. Thank you, Joy. I hear you. Thank you for showing up the way you do always. I would love to have some few minutes at the end where we can perhaps soothe in some way. So if, and I think we have time for another, um, somebody who wants to share something before that. I just, I just want to put a little frame, you know, if it's going outside your comfort zone, just inviting you to take that little step, you know, it'd be so sweet to hear another voice and there's no pressure to speak if there's not words or something to be shared. And I'd be really happy to sing. I don't know if you and there's something you would want to bring as part of a closing of this circle, but um, I'd be really happy to offer a song or something. It's part of soothing.
I know I speak a lot, um, although I am actually quite a shy person. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, there's something really alive um, and just taking from what Joy was sharing, um, this is not an answer, by the way, but I feel that in myself, there is that um, striving for how do I make that circle that is all inclusive? How do I make that board meeting where everybody's listened? How do I make these social technologies available to everyone? How do we include in our projects people from everywhere? And um, in my work in rewilding, I got to know two <laughs> other, there's a lot of connections with Austra Australia, I'm realizing. There is the Bradley, I don't, I don't know if they're called Bradley. Yeah, the Bradley sisters. They did a lot of reforestation and their message, the way I translated into anything is that you start with the places that are the healthiest. I mean, the broken places that are in the healthiest. And that's what they did. And it was, it has been one of the most successful soft ways of large landscape regeneration. They didn't start in the places where the seeds had been depleted. They started where there was something and that had a cascading. So it's maybe, maybe, so what I, what I took from that is that I now try to hold spaces with the intention that they are for everyone and knowing that the people who are already interested where their hearts are kind of resonating with mine are the ones who are going to show up. And I try to be just happy with that. And it's not, it doesn't work all the time, but it's my new practice. And somehow that was really alive to share. So thank you. I'd love to share a last word if that if that would be all right. You know, and and um, you know, I, I want I want to honour and appreciate uh, all of our different responses to what we're finding in ourselves and in our world. You know, and that they each have a different place and a different shape. And for you know, and 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 how we can you know create the change towards you know all of those beautiful. Uh, words that you put in you know this vision to even have a vision of what a healthy culture would be for me is a radical and important um, step that so many people don't even have a vision for it it's like we've lost the capacity and to acknowledge that even when we vision it we may meet the pain of how much we've lost you know we speak about this gateway of what we expected and did not receive it's like actually when we touch our longing we touch the pain of not having it but if we don't dare to you know let ourselves feel our longing and our grief for what's not there how can we ever you know to taste it or smell it on the breeze when there's a little whiff of it in that meeting that we had or that relationship or, you know, this words that somebody's speaking. So uh, just honoring our willingness to do that and to move towards it and to find it in the cells of our body as well as in, in the beauty of nature and the, and the world around us and in the places that are broken and devastated, you know, and, and the suffering that that brings us in our body that we know it's wrong, that it shouldn't be like that. And that there's a taste of health, even when we find the most, um, the, the, you know, the places of devastation. So just honoring all of that. And it's really beautiful to hear taste and, you know, those that haven't spoken. I'd have such a trust in that we'll find the peace that our particular, you know, weird combination of, of, of journeys in this weird messed up world, you know, how do we navigate this world is so bewildering. But anyway, just wanting to really honor whatever you're doing and however you're working on it in yourself, with others, in your personal relationships and families, in the work that you do, in your dreaming, in your creativity, you know, thank you, thank you. And 
you know, may we keep blessing each other um, and supporting each other. Yeah. I, I just want it's such a passion of mine. I'm just going to say to Vicky, I, I stopped gendering the archetypes because it just starts a huge argument or it raises the charge between men and women. So for me, it was a phenomenological experiment that it was unhelpful. So I've stopped doing it. <laughs> it's very practical. It just didn't help the conversation. So I've stopped. It feels more helpful to have these, these archetypes ungendered. And I'm curious if the gendering of them somehow supports patriarchal concepts in an unhealthy culture. Anyway, I just, such a, yeah. I'd love to sing. Can I sing about, you know, maybe I, someone else could sing. I would love to just uh, Hear you invite in. Yin if you want to say something as well. You don't have to. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty happy with the singing. I'll just um, say a couple of things in closing, which is that it's not up to us to change the world. I want to. I want to. I want to say that to people. You don't need a roadmap. You don't need to even want to change the world. You just need to have radical receptivity and openness to the vastness of the living cosmos which includes everything inside and outside and dissolving of that boundary just be willing to receive and you will then be able to flow with the exuberance of existence now let's have a song. Dita, do you want to sing? Would you rather? Um, no, I, 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 I'm happy for you to do that. It's lovely I'm to just hear gonna you. Sing a little one. Feel free to join. Uh, I'm loving the water images. Ancient mother, I hear you calling, ancient mother, I hear your song, ancient mother, I hear your laughter, ancient mother, I taste your tears. Ancient Father, I hear you calling. Ancient Father, I hear your song. Ancient Father, I hear your laughter. Ancient Father, I taste your tears, ancient spirit, I hear you calling, ancient spirit, I hear your song, ancient spirit, I hear your laughter, ancient spirit, I taste your tears. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dita. Thank you. We Thank just done you. And Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, everybody who came and all the ones who are here with us in our teacher, as teachers, stories, ancestors, loved ones, not so loved ones. Everybody's part of us. And one of the reasons I offer these spaces is because I think 
everything we do in ourselves has ripples and affects way more than we often acknowledge. So I do invite everyone before Vicky takes us in into heavenly harp, harpole heaven <laughs> um, to really be gentle with yourselves. Um, and as Jean said a few days ago uh, or longer, look for the epiphanies in your day, look for the small things that actually make life. Thank you, thank you everyone for showing up as you are. Love you. Thank you, Vicky. And people who need to go, just you can peel off as you want and I'll be here until the last one. Thank you. Jean is going to be also offering a workshop later during now what? Um, at least one <laughs> um, about decolonial strategies, decolonial futures. 
it's really not so convenient for European or UK time. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a chat with you, Yin, about another one uh, more for our nick of the world. Thank you, Vicky. I think I'm going to book you for all my sessions, just in case. Thank you, Elena. I'm so happy that you're here. Me too.